John Sawat once pointed out there's an important riddle to contemplate in the practice. On the one hand, the Buddha said that all phenomena are not self. That seeing things in that way, that's part of the path. On the other hand, there's that point we're supposed to contemplate every day. I am the owner of my actions, heir to my actions, born of my actions, related to my actions. Whatever I do for good or for evil, to that will I fall heir. There's very definitely an I am there. So it's good to think about that riddle. And it relates to the point that while we're practicing the path, we're actually trying to develop a certain state of mind, what's called a state of becoming. Becoming happens on three levels. There's sensuality, there's form, and there's formlessness. We're trying to create a state form, staying with the breath, inhabiting the whole body, seeing the whole body as breath, being aware of the whole body as breath. Now, to get there, you have to put aside sensuality, your fascination with your sensual desires, because it's only when the mind is in this state of form, that it can see things clearly, it can watch the processes of the mind very clearly. When you're dealing more with sensuality, you're more focused on the object of your desire. And the processes of the mind get very muddled. So we do what we can to put aside our sensual desires, to focus more on our desires for the state of form, the ease and pleasure, the sense of refreshment and fullness that comes from inhabiting the body in this way. When the breath feels easy, unblocked, and connected, there's a sense of abundant breath energy all around the body that we can tap into at any time. So the breath isn't a struggle. The breath can be effortless. That's a sense of well-being, and it's possible to get attached to it. And you actually do have to get attached to it if you want to get good at it, to stay here long enough so you can really can observe the process of what's involved in creating the state of becoming to begin with. Now, as the Buddha says, becoming comes from clinging and craving. We all know that clinging and craving are part of the cause of suffering, but they're also important aspects of the path to the end of suffering. You learn how to use them wisely and skillfully, and it can actually take you around the problem of suffering and attack it from a different direction. Now, clinging comes in four types. There's sensual clinging, clinging to views, clinging to habits and practices, and clinging to doctrines of the self. Now, that first kind of clinging is not useful in giving rise to a state of good, strong concentration. Sensuality clinging does not help at all. You need a certain amount of sensual pleasure, i.e. the body needs the strength that comes from eating, and a sense of well-being. to get into the states of concentration, especially in the beginning. As you get more practiced, you find that you can get into them in less and less conducive environments. But it's good to have a good, quiet place. This is why the Buddha emphasized going out into the wilderness, because the pleasures of the wilderness don't cost anything. They're just there. And they provide the kind of quiet background where it's easy for the mind to get settled down. 
and ask for food he has, you'll be content with what you get. And contemplate the food as you eat it, why you're eating it. To drive off feelings of hunger, to give the body the strength it needs in order to practice. So there's a fairly restricted range here for sensual pleasure, enough to give the mind the environment it needs to settle down and get focused more on how to inhabit the body, this f form of the body that we've got right here. And this involves the other three kinds of clinging. You cling to the view that this is going to be good, this is going to be helpful. And this is the spot where you can examine the processes of the mind in terms of what's causing suffering and what can lead to the end of suffering. You cling to the precepts that help provide the right environment for practicing concentration. And you have to hold on to the idea that you are actually doing this. That's where that reflection, I'm the owner of my actions, comes in. That's as far as the Buddha goes in terms of defining the self. Other people would define the self in terms of whether it's finite or infinite, whether it has form or doesn't have form, whether it's eternal or what the issues are in defining what I am. The Buddha leaves that pretty much unexplained, unexplored, for the purpose of the path. He has you take apart any attachment you might have to a specific idea that you are this or you are that, aside from this one, that you're the agent that does action. You're also the person that experiences that quality of the action depending on whether the action is skillful or unskillful. That much you maintain. So even though the Buddha doesn't go too far into the idea of what I am, there still is the idea that I am the owner and the heir of my actions. That's all you need in order to stay on the path. It's the same way that he doesn't encourage sensual clinging or sensual passion, but he does have room for sensual pleasure on the path. In other words, he's more interested in you having a sense not so much what you are, but what you do. You are the doer. And when you experience, there's also a doing in the experiencing. You want to look for that as well, because it's not just that you're sitting here totally passive, experiencing the results of past karma. You're also creating present karma, present intentions right now. And the intentions you have right now are going to determine what you experience and what you focus on what you do with what you focus on. Again, it's a doing that's important here. So what you are doesn't go beyond, beyond what you are as a doer. So that you focus not so much on your identity here, but the actual quality of your actions, the quality of your intentions. The intention right now is to stay with the breath, to make the breath comfortable. to fill your awareness of the body with breath, to fill, fill your body with your awareness so that the ease of the breath doesn't just simply put you to sleep. You want to be alert, have what's called an enlarged awareness, an enlarged mind, mahakatang jitang. Because when your awareness is enlarged like this, it's a lot easier to see the processes of the mind to see where there are still attachments to unskillful mental states, unskillful ideas. So you start first by letting go of the unskillful things, realize that you don't have to identify with them. Crazy thoughts come into your mind, stupid thoughts come into your mind, harmful thoughts come into your mind. You don't have to identify with them. Just see them for what they are as events coming and going in the mind, and you figure out how to let them go. Well, in the meantime, you hold on to your concentration. You hold on to your precepts. You hold on to your right views. 
and you hold on to the idea that you are capable of developing greater and greater skill. It's only when you don't need these things anymore that you totally let them go. It's like that image of the raft. You need the raft to get across the river, so while you're on the raft, don't let it go. When you've got to the other side, then you can put it aside. You don't need to carry it on your head anymore. But make sure you don't let go of the raft in midstream, because it's the only way you're going to get across. So as we practice, there are attachments. There is clinging. We try to hold to right view, because that's the kind of view that helps cut through all the things that focus our attention away from what we're doing and the results of what we're doing. We hold to the precepts, we hold to the practice of concentration, because it makes life a lot easier. And it really helps in seeing what's going on in the mind, when you can get the mind really, really still, with a sense of well-being and ease. The well-being and the knees are important because they put you in the right mood for noticing what you've been doing that's not skillful, and admitting it frankly and with a good sense of humor. And you hold on to the idea that you are capable of doing this. You're responsible for the choices you're making. That's the raft. So these are a few thoughts about that riddle that John Sowett posed. When you learn how to think in this way, it cuts through a lot of the other conundrums that people say, well, how can you get to the un unconditioned by doing conditioned things? And if you're supposed to let go of attachment, why are you holding on to the path? It's like the raft. You're not holding onto the raft because you want to keep the raft at all times, but it's what you need right now. It's like a John Chaz comment when someone asks you, well, you've got that coconut there. Why are you carrying the husk, too? Are you going to eat the husk? Well, no. Then why are you carrying the husk? It's because the time hasn't come yet to let it go. When you got home, cut up the coconut, put it into the curry, that's when you can let go of the husk. In the meantime, right now you're carrying the, carrying the coconut, so you need the husk. The Buddhist path is strategic. It's not simple-minded. And strategy sometimes requires, if you want to go left, sometimes you have to go right first. It's like going to Los Angeles from what Metta. It would make sense to drive northwest because that's the direction Los Angeles lies. But we don't have any road going northwest straight from the monastery. You have to go south first, and then east, and then northeast before you can go northwest. The important thing is that. Even with all these twists and turns, the road actually takes you to where you want to go. Always keep that point in mind. <laughs>